Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House with my good friend and colleague, Martin Popoff. Good morning, my friend. How are you yes, this morning? Good morning, sir. No, doing okay. Doing okay. Got out for a jog yesterday. It was kind of nice and warm, so I'm kind of destroyed today. Plus, then I hurt my back lifting a box of uh, uh, Dio books this morning, so that was that ticked me off but no it's going to get cold again here uh, apparently but uh, it was it was very nice yesterday gotta lift those boxes of books so you can take them out and pack them and ship them right unfortunately uh, we're, we're not getting any younger and uh, <laughs> lifting no. heavy shit just does not doesn't work well these days yeah right? for sure yeah. yeah the sun is shining in new in uh, new york here this morning Good. we had rain all day yesterday and ridiculous fog i went to see martin Barr in concert last night about an hour away and i literally drove to yeah. the entire show in this dense ridiculous fog and then coming back it was foggy and pouring rain i'm like oh wow sucks. and now it's yeah. a little mild this morning i see all the, all the, the worms are out on the back patio and i'm like you need to get oh up. yeah you're gonna bake in that sun in about an hour it's like come on guys how'd you get here yeah, yeah. so uh <laughs> anyway we've got a fun show for you here today so we uh have long talked and joked between the two of us about these bands that we each really like that we know the other one doesn't like and a lot of people have asked like when are you guys going to address that whole situation well we're going to do it today so uh the title of today's episode is i understand why you think this band sucks basically so we've each picked five bands from each other that we know the other doesn't like that we like so you know Bands that Martin loves that I just don't get, bands that I love that Martin doesn't get. And we're going to kind of talk about why we totally understand the reasons why you don't like them, because there's probably things about each of these bands that is, seems just pretty common, and it, it's easy to rationalize why certain people may not like them. And we may offer up some information and tidbits and incentive to go check out certain things in the catalog that might sway uh, the other person to maybe go reinvestigate this band in this catalog. So with all that being said, I'll have Martin kick us off with his first selection for me. Okay, we'll see how this goes. I haven't really thought this through, but we'll uh, we'll, we'll give it a shot here. Uh, New York Dolls. I'm going to start with New York Dolls. So they only made the two albums. They obviously had the reunion stuff later on, which I think is also very good. And why I understand why uh, a lot of people think this band sucks Um I think the whole the whole, you know, complete in drag thing didn't go over all that well. Um, also, this is a, this is a New York. This is a very critics darling band in New York. Also, there was a lot of hype on them. Um, you know, you talk to them and the apocryphal. I've, I've mentioned this before, but David Krebs said, you know, like he was involved with with the New York Dolls. And uh, and he said, you know, there, there would be a mountain of press on them. Uh, and there was lots of press even before the albums came out. But um so so there's that um there's also you know it's gotten into the press it's leaked out uh in terms of this idea of them um not being a very good live band and sloppy and they always obviously they had their drug problems including heroin and that so and maybe it's true they were not that good live um so that that gives a gives a negative connotation another thing that's kind of negative about them i think that i can understand is david johansson has a very shouty voice it's a very it's a very um, Mick Jagger, Mike Monroe, a little bit Roger Daltrey, not so much Roger, but mostly Mick Jagger. And he, and he looks like Mick Jagger a little bit. So, so the vocals are very brutish and, and, and manly, like a pipe fitter guy. You know, it's, it's, he, he sounds like a plumber singing for this band, although they definitely don't look like that, right? Uh, but there's that. And I understand, you know, I, also a little more uh, towards tailoring to pete's tastes i mean this has this has some old rock and roll some boogie woogie some garage to it um the, the, these sorts of sounds that i think in in total aren't leaning towards things that pete naturally likes right um so it's it's a little it's a little rock you know and punky right that's the other thing it's a punky version of those things right um but i would i would say they're worth taking a listen to because these albums have a lot of variety on them. They're well recorded. They're well performed. They're not particularly punky. I mean, this is 73, 74. It's not a particularly punk time. Um, but yeah, only a couple albums of material. It's it's heavy. And, you know, I, I suppose some of the song construction is raw, but I wouldn't say the recordings or the performances are raw. So it's I, I think a lot of people have a little bit of a misconception of how of how dirty and raw and punky those albums are. They aren't really that way. They're more like get your wings. 
um, they're, they're more in that sort of range. Um, I, I, I think both of them are, are better executed than Aerosmith Aerosmith, for example. Um, and they're not up to toys in the attic or rocks, but they're get your wings. Um, so they're, so they're kind of in that realm. So, uh, you know, so that's a band I know Pete doesn't like, I mean, huge critic dar darlings, like I say, um, and that maybe might rub you the wrong way as well. I mean, none of us like the idea of a band being overhyped, right? And this is definitely an overhyped band. So there you go. That's my first one, New York Dolls. Yeah. And, and I own both of those and I, I don't hate them. I don't much like them though. You know, it's a weird band. I, and, it, and it's so funny because there's this kind of thing here in New York where uh, the idea is that if you're from New York, you have to embrace and love all the New York bands. And there are some that I just don't feel that way about. They're, the Dolls are one of them. Uh, you know, Twisted Sisters, another one. The Ramones are another one. It's like, I, you know, I'm just like, yeah, I know I'm from New York. I should support the New York bands. And I've really tried with the dolls because I think on the surface, everything about them I should like. I generally love bands from that era, regardless of where they're from, what they look like. And I, you know, for the most part, I, I just love early 70s bands. I'm not crazy about the vocals. I think yeah. that's part of the big thing with me. I don't mind the look and the image. I don't mind the fact that, uh, you know, they're kind of garagey and, and all that sort of thing. I, I, I guess there's always a, there always seemed to be this stigma with them that, that when I listen to the music, I always thought they were supposed to be heavier. And I don't find the music all that heavy. I, I do find it very raw. Is it punky or not? Yeah, maybe. Again, there was no real punk at the time, so it's kind of hard to say. But I, I, I keep going back to those albums and I listen to them. And I'm like, man, I really want to love this. And I guess part of me kind of feels like the, with those two first albums there that they were still kind of finding their way. And then that was all they did until much, much later on. And I almost felt like they were working towards something. And then that something just never quite hit for me. Yeah. So I don't know. Is there I just, a little bit in New York, like in, in Canada, definitely there's a, we we're, we're almost programmed not to like Canadian bands because we think, ah, you're from here. There's nothing special about you. There's no mystique. I can see right through. Yeah. I know. I know you're, I know your Canadian -ness, right. And I mean, with New York bands, do you sometimes think there's just no magic because I, I know you, I, I know what you're like. No, I think here it's expected. You're not from Britain. What's, what's that? It's, it's expected here. Like it's most people you mm -hmm. talk to, it's like you wow. have to support the New York bands. And if you wow. don't, like, if you like, if, if, for instance, if I like, you know, if you meet someone here and you find out that they're from New York and they don't like Billy Joel, it's just, the person is shocked. They're like, how, wow. how can you not like Billy Joel? That's like, you know, apple pie for New York, right? It's just, you, you can't not like Billy Joel. I get the same reaction from New Yorkers when I tell them I don't care for the Ramones. It's like, it's sacrilege. Um, so yeah, it's really weird. It's this weird thing with New Yorkers. It's like, you have to, you know, you have to love, you know, only New York sports teams whatever they are and it's like and if because like you, you meet someone from new york and they tell you they love the dallas cowboys you're like what how can you follow the dallas cowboys you're from new york you're supposed to love the giants or the jets right uh so yeah it's it's weird here for whatever reason and again i don't really buy into it um but it's it is it's the way it is so funny thing about new york too is that they have uncommon uh, you, they you new york city let's say um you know <laughs> everything else is small compared to new york city but New York City really underpunches in terms of how many great acts came out of New York, right? Compared yeah. to so many other music capitals around the world, right? You're absolutely like, right. There's not a lot of, there's, I mean, obviously there's a lot, but there's not, you know, you think of our heavy metal world, right? And just New York has never been considered a heavy metal place, right? No, no. I, I mean, right. I was actually doing this before we went on today, thinking about it. And I'm like, all right, so who else can, so I listed a couple, who else? Blue Arch the Cult, Dream Theater. Yeah. You know, it's like, Riot. Yeah, really, yeah. Yeah. You got to really think about it. Close enough. Right. Well, close enough. Yeah. Anthrax exactly. close enough. Yeah. 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 You, know, you go to New Jersey and there's a ton. All of a sudden, New Jersey, you start rattling off, you know, Bon Jovi yeah. and it's, a, you know, this with the Bruce Springsteen and, and a ton of others. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Maybe because there's not this plethora of them that people think you got to hold them close, right? You got to support the New York bands, the New York music, music scene. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. All right, my uh, my first choice of the day is Journey. So Journey is kind of a polarizing band. 
I think for a lot of people. And I, you, you sometimes wonder, is it because they got so huge and they're so everywhere? I mean, Journey play all the, you have all these songs played on the radio. They made a lot of money. They appear on the award shows. They play at the, you know, the sporting events, they show up on the new year's Eve. And, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just like, they've got a lot of syrupy ballads, some good memorable rock anthems, but to a lot of people, it's like, unless you're a really big fan, it's like, oh my God, Journey, if I ever hear any of those songs again, I'm going to shoot myself, right? And then you got you got the guy, you know, Steve Perry, who, you, whoever, depending on who you talk to, the greatest singer of all time, or yeah, that guy with the annoying voice, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, we got into a whole discussion months ago about Steve Perry, and, and I, you know, I heard what you said, and I was like, and I really couldn't argue it, because while I personally think that Steve Perry was an amazing vocalist, I get it. I understand why some people might cringe hearing that voice. Because, you know, he's got the, the, the crooning thing and he can do the histrionic stuff. And sometimes he's a little over the top. Um, and, and I get all that. And, and, you know, I think when Journey released Escape and Frontiers and became like these this real superstar band, you know, they, they crossed over into that territory of those big bands that are just like so overexposed. Where, you know, for me, when I do this argument of, for or against journey, you know, I have to go back to the pre days of that and even the post days of that. So like, you know, and again, I know Martin is not big on like, uh, like instrumental or fusion type music, but uh, you know, the first album is absolutely spectacular. And I know that the people who are who journey fans who don't like the whole Steve Perry thing, they will always cite this album or, you know, the second album, because here's where musically they're taking what uh, Neil and Greg were doing in Santana and taking it into a more, you know, taking that kind of like Latin jazz rock thing and bringing it away from the Latin feel to just a more jazz rock, contemporary hard rock type of thing. Uh, you know, for me, for my money, I think the Infinity album is the apex of Steve Perry's time in the band. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I think so, because A, it's early on in his tenure in the band and he's still sharing lead vocals with Greg Raleigh, who is a terrific singer. So for someone who thinks that, you know, hearing Steve Perry throughout the whole album, all him is a little overbearing, like you probably do, Martin. This is the album I think to get because here you've got, he's on most of the tracks, but he's still sharing vocals with Greg Raleigh and Greg Raleigh always thought was a terrific singer. And this is just a great rock record. Yeah, it's got a couple hits on it, but it's, it's just really, really good dramatic uh, rock music of the time. And, you know, Departure also is is pretty good hard rock record, but the Steve Perry thing notwithstanding. So he's been gone from the band for a million years. And, you know, the opposite are the people who think that this band can't exist without him. Right. You've got the people who he's too much and I don't really like them with him. And then there's the people like you can't have a journey without him. You know, I would argue that Eclipse, which is the last studio album, they, they've got a new one coming out, but the last studio album they did with Arnel Pineda is a terrific hard rock album. And there's really, there's no hits on this. It's not really all that commercial. And I mean, we haven't talked about Neil Sean yet here in this discussion, but what a terrific in the pocket for the song guitar player. Great riffs, killer solos. To some, he sounds a little formulaic because everything sounds too perfect all the time. You go see them live, he plays everything note for note. But it, it's just perfectly executed from within each song. And I, I love this album because it's not overly commercial and people just ignored this like the plague, which is a shame because there's a lot of really, really great songs here. But, I, you know, I get it. This band has this kind of corporate -y type of thing to it because of their success, because they were everywhere. And I think, uh, you know, when most people, maybe specifically not here in, in the U.S., uh, think of like that kind of overplayed corporate American rock, like Journey's like the poster child for, for something like that. So I totally get it. I love them, but they're not for everybody. And that's totally cool. And, you know, the, the, the big choruses and the kind of formulaic nature of the music, I understand. I love them personally, but Martin, I totally, totally get why you don't. Yeah, I mean, the corporate-y thing, I, I do feel, and that does bother me, but that's that's kind of like small of me to, to be that way, because because that's that's not something you should complain about. But um, another couple of things. So I definitely fall on the on the side of um, annoying voice, right? Um, you know, 
sing. I always separate singing and voice, you know, and, and sure, he's a great singer and stuff, but, but just the, the thing God gave him that voice, uh, I don't think is a great voice. Um, <laughs> not crazy about it, right? Um, another thing that bothers me, I've always found those productions to be kind of annoying and not matching the music very well. It's, it's not very listenable, all that big mic stone noise and echo going on. Um, and another thing about Journey that kind of bothered me, and I went through a, a big Journey kick. I'm, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but I remember buying up all the albums for a buck a piece when there was this big basement of dollar records about 25 years ago. And I just went crazy and bought tons and tons of things and all the Journey was there, right? So I thought, okay, I got to get all this. And I picked out all the songs I really loved and all this. But uh, another thing that bothers me is, um, and this happens with like the Eagles and Motley Crue, and even to some extent, Van Halen, this idea of over time and Aerosmith, well, not, Steven Tyler, put it that way. Joe Perry, maybe a bit too, but mostly Steven Tyler. This idea of over time, you get to hear the stories of, well, Neil Sean's kind of a jerky guy, right? Um, Steve Perry, eccentric, weird, kind of a jerky guy, it seems like. Um, uh, Jonathan Kane, I've definitely heard that about as well. And I've interviewed Jonathan Kane. I've interviewed Greg Raleigh. I've interviewed Neil Sean, and they were perfectly beautiful guys, you know, uh, to talk to or whatever. So I don't know how true any of this is, right? But you hear all that over the years and these guys suing each other and all this. And then Eagles and Journey specifically, you put it together with these are songs about relationships and love and sympathy and, and all this. And so they can't even do it in their so, own band, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't line up, right? It's like, it's like, well, you're kind of jerky guys and you're singing these boy girl songs and it sounds like you're like the least qualified people to be doing this, <laughs> right? So, so it feels fakey, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that always bothered me as well with Journey. It's, it's like, I, and you hear the prima donna stories, uh, not so much with Journey, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but Eagles definitely, you hear the prima donna stories right um so yeah so, so those are some of the reasons right there and just the sappy the formulaic thing i don't think they have a lot to say in the lyrics otherwise um so yeah there's there's a bunch of reasons there and you know it comes down to this thing where you know you talk with with major music fans and i always have this debate sometimes it's like you gotta put some people on your list of bands you don't like you can't say you love everybody right yeah. because we tend to do that right when you really like music a lot there's not a lot of bands you don't like and it's like at, at some point you gotta you gotta draw that line in the sand and say you know what i'm sticking this band below that line yeah. journey is one of those yeah i hear you i hear it now uh, your thoughts on arnel pineda have you listened to much of the material with him sounds great um <laughs> but there's a little bit of that uh ronnie romero thing to him where where you you are a little distracted that english is in his first language and it's like of all the choices you could have made i mean god love him you know coming from the philippines and that and it's great and it's great that the band had an open mind to do that but it's like it's it's like when you hear when you hear a band go out and say we auditioned 100 singers and we hired this guy turned out he didn't work out because he didn't write songs it's like you couldn't have checked that beforehand right so so here you've got you've got one of the few guys you could have tried where there is this extra little problem, right? Yeah. And so I can never get that out of my mind. I'm, I'm thinking of, of the way he pronounces things and the diction and all that when, he, when he's singing. It's like, it's a distraction to me. I, I'm sorry, it just kind of is, right? Yeah, um, sometimes it's hard to get past that the years, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. And, and like the Ronnie Romero thing, and it's like Ronnie's on everybody's album, right? And it's, it's like, well, it's, 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 an, it's an odd thing where uh, it, it's, it's like when, uh, when, you know, people talk about, you know, I have this debate with people about learning French or learning a second language, right? It's like, do I really want to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours learning a second language when I only use one at a time? And even if I spend those hundreds and hundreds of hours, I'm, I'm going to be about as good a French speaker as a six-year-old kid, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm never going to use it. I'm going to keep forget all the time. Right. Right. That's a good point. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's just, just strange. So anyways, <laughs> all right. My, my second choice. Um, what do we got next? We got the clash. So we've all talked about the clash London calling greatest album of all time. The only band that matters, right? The clash <laughs> on the cover of time magazine. I think it was, Although I say that all the time, I, I sometimes I wonder if these things are true. I know Springsteen was on time, right? Yes, he was. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's the second album. Love the second album. There's one I don't like so much, the the big album, because it had Should I Stay or Should I Go on it? Oh, no. 
what else? Actually, yeah, that's the only hit, the only hit they ever had kind of thing. Uh, I suppose London Callings turned out to be a deep tracks hit, but I can understand why why you don't like it. This is one of those you had to be there kind of situations. All of punk is kind of like that. It's like it's like the mood and the place and you got to be an Anglophile and you got to like be into, you know, the minor strike and the heat wave and Margaret Thatcher and all this stuff. Stuff to, to love sort of the whole package of all this stuff right and that's and the story of punk and punk in london versus new york and all this and and the political things and having an album called sandinista but so so it is it is sort of a punk band but then they changed and then they got a little heavier but it was still punky and then london calling not punky at all too many music styles it's confusing i can understand that um I, I know, was it Jamie who said, you know, like, it's kind of comedic at times? It's like, oh, I, I noticed that. And it's kind of true. They had kind of a disco we hit with Train in Vain. Um, they do reggae. This is white guys doing reggae. Are they doing it good? Are they doing it bad? You know, who knows, right? Is it cultural appropriation? You've got both singers. Um, Mick Jones can be a little uh, uh, flat and sharp challenged at times. Uh, odd voice and then you've got joe strummer who's a who's this punk shouter kind of guy and it's easy to not like joe's vocals right so if you're a big vocal aficionado you're, you're you might not be crazy about the clash you get to lo- a lo- um, combat rock and cut the crap and you've got all this dub and electronic stuck in it and and that can be really annoying that's annoying to me as well so yeah it's a it's a very baffling band um but you know, I, I just love, I love the lyrics. I love the whole idea of the clash. I love the fearlessness and the weird styles, all the different things they do. They're one of my favorite bands of all time, but, uh, but I can understand if, uh, if you're coming from a whole different place where you love Prague and fusion and great productions and all that stuff, you know, anything semi in that realm is in a whole different place from all that. Right. Yeah. I, you know, God, I, I have been told for decades like pete why how do you not like the clash and i'm like oh you know i've never been a punk guy that is no surprise right i've I've said that a million times i've never been a big punk guy ironically i don't find this band a punk band at all and particularly no yeah right but they're always kind of they're always kind of labeled that and yeah i remember you know you and i've had many discussions about uh london calling and i had this big discussion with mike portnoy about it uh, and he's like really you don't like that album I'm like ah, i've never owned it i've heard m- most of it whatever so i was like all right i'm gonna go out and get it you know and i went and i was like i was really wanting to be pleasantly surprised because i'm like this is labeled as one of the greatest albums of all time and i love the title track i absolutely love that song and then I get it and I'm kind of like, and you, I mean, you put it perfectly. It's like, it, it's stylistically all over the place. And I, you know, they're doing like reggae and this weird kind of schmartzy pop stuff. And there's really nothing punk on there. And really the only the song that could even be labeled that is the title track, which ironically is the only song that I like. And I just, I found, I just hated this album and I, I wanted to like it because you know me, I, you know, I love in in most cases these historically uh, highly respected albums. I mean, I I have this thing about music history and these albums that are legendary and it's like, you know, but I just I just don't get it. I don't get it. And I've gone and I've listened to other of their albums and I'm just like, I almost wish they were the punk band that everybody says they are. And they did more stuff like London Calling. I want to hear heavy, raucous you know, kind of riffy clash, but maybe that's just not the band. And that's the kind of music I gravitate towards. And maybe that's, you know, that's just not who they are. And this isn't a band for me. And I've kind of accepted that now. And it's like, so when the topic of the clash comes up, I'm like, I'm glad you love them. I want to love them. I just don't. And I, and I've, I've yeah. since I've given up. I've like, all right, you know what, this yeah. is just, there, there are, and, and you said it perfectly. It's like, we can't claim to love everything. And sometimes we have to draw the line. And I'm a perfect example of someone who, expects that I should love everything because I like to think I'm pretty open-minded. So like sometimes with these bands where I'm hitting a wall, I go the extra mile and really try my best. All right, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. Yeah. And I've, I'm done trying with the clash. I'm just, I, I, I'm just done. You know, the New York dolls, I'm still holding out hopes for, but the, you know, the, the clash, I'm just kind of like, I just don't get it. I don't get it. They're just not for me. 
It's you know, it's a it's a funny thing. We did a contrarian's dark horse episode last night on the Who It's Hard. And you know, we're having a hard time, you know, <laughs> finding good things about this. And I'm looking at the thing and I pull out the inner sleeve, and it's got this massive bank of lyrics on one side, and that's just one side of the album. Then you flip it over, it's got this massive bank of lyrics. So it's like at one point I said, you know, maybe it's a good read, but it's not a good listen. And clash can somewhat be a bit like that too. It's definitely a good read. <laughs> so yeah 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 it's hard that's another one i, I love the who but yeah. those kenny jones albums for me just <laughs> and i know you're big on them but i, I just and i again i want to love them but i just i like the ferocious early who for me that's just kind of i don't know i respect those albums i do i listen to them from time to time i don't, I don't love them anyway that's a whole other subject so <laughs> all right <sighs> all right so where are we moving on to so now we're going to go on to chicago right (laughs) so this is a very intriguing band chicago nine chicago 10 chicago yeah i know yeah well besides for all that yeah right and the covers that all look the same and yeah um this is like a tale of two bands here probably three or more actually but there is the terry kath era which is the experimental uh pretty damn amazing uh rock fusion type of a band who also did pop hits as well and then there's the like ridiculous hit machine chicago that came out in the early 80s and then there's everything after that right which is chicago trying to continue being the 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 big hit band but nobody's listening anymore type of thing right so you know the unfortunate thing is for many of us who are into hard rock and metal uh it's oftentimes hard to listen to bands with horns because I will, I will be the first to admit when I was younger and, you know, um, Sabbath and Purple and Maiden and Priest and Scorpions and all that kind of stuff. If ever there was a saxophone solo or something or a trumpet solo on one of the albums from a band that I loved, I was instantly like, no, you can't do that. Right. You just can't do it. Uh, but, you know, I, I grew up hearing lots of Chicago songs on the radio in the 70s. I mean, they, and I never disliked them. Uh, and I even remember in the early 80s when, you know, they, they had all these major, major hits and we were just blowing up all over the place and thinking, hey, you know, all right, what's whatever. But in the years since, and probably specifically since I got into Prague really heavily about 30 years ago, uh, I went back and, and reinvestigated this band because a good buddy of mine is a huge Chicago fan and had him and his brother who had been since they were kids. And I found that this band early on and specifically with stuff like, you know, the debut and the, the second album and the third album, all three of which are double albums. I mean, who does that in music history? Who starts off right off the bat and releases three double albums in a row and then releases a quadruple live album and then another double? It's just it's ridiculous. Uh, Chicago Five, which is a little is single album, but much more stripped down because the first couple albums are all these kind of like all these extended suites mixing jazz and rock and hard rock and some Latin tinge stuff and some pop. Uh, and then you got, you know, some of these latter period albums before uh, Terry Kath, uh, you know, killed himself and very experimental band threw in some really good accessible hit pop songs amidst all this other really, really intricately woven uh, arrangements and songs that are highly progressive, I think. And some of the, the most amazing guitar playing you'll hear from the 70s. I mean, Terry Kath was just an absolute genius. Um, but I, I think there's this perception out there that that Chicago was all about shit like this. Chicago 16 and 17. This is where Chicago became enormous. And all of a sudden the horns went away to an extent. They're still here. But now, you know, David Foster is involved and Peter Cetera takes over. And it's all about these kind of sappy ballads and these really lush arrangements. And I got to say, this isn't Chicago. So there's a couple of schools of thought here. There are the people that grew up with this. And this is amazing because they're the songs of my youth, the songs of, you know, dating you know, my wife and getting married and the, the, the soundtrack to my wedding and my high school graduation, blah, 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 blah. And this stuff is just kind of weird and like really too 
out there. Too much horns, too many guitar solos, long songs, big, long suites, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the people who grew up on this, who this is like, you know, you do not speak of this stuff, right? This is not Chicago anymore. So I get both camps big time. But, I, you know, I think that uh, the people who really, really gravitate towards this stuff probably are never going to like this. And the people who really, really love this are never going to accept this. But, you know, Chicago made a shitload of money doing this. And it's just a shame that... Terry Kath never, I mean, these albums were fairly big too. You know, these were pretty big selling albums for the seventies, but nothing like this stuff. And it's a shame that Terry Kath never got his just due. But I, I, I understand like why, you know, big time hard rock and metal fans might get scared away from this. Cause even there are some hits on these albums. And again, the horn thing, especially on the early albums, is just too much. If you don't like sax and trumpet and trombone flugelhorn, this is going to be like, ugh. but I, I would urge anybody who, you know, maybe has that kind of uh, thing happening to listen a little bit beyond that. Cause there are really some good, there's some good rock and stuff on there. There's some amazing guitar playing. And I love the fact that you have like three different vocalists in this band. And, uh, but yeah, I totally get it. I, you know, if I were Martin, I would say I would give the very, very first album another chance. This is terrific and it's pretty heavy in spots. And there's some, you know, I, I would urge you not to go get any of the one big rambling live albums because that you're going to be like, Oh my God, I'm like bored out of my mind, long guitar solos, long drum solos, all that kind of stuff. But uh but a really cool band up to a point. And yeah, I personally, I don't have a lot of use for this stuff anymore. I can appreciate it for what it is. But for me, the early Chicago stuff is truly groundbreaking music. And uh, there you go. Yeah, you've convinced me. I mean, I, I do have to try that stuff again. But definitely David Foster, Peter Cetera, that stuff drove me crazy. I, I, I hate that stuff. And I really do not like horns. Uh, in, in I mean, the only place I like horns is in really weird kraut rock, right? Uh, or or an English band who sounds like that, you know, a, right. a Vandergraaf generator sounds like that, right? That that sort of idea. Anybody who's a little kraut rocky, right? I don't know. Are there actually horns of Vandergraaf anywhere? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, are, yeah. yeah. You got so uh, Vandergraaf and kraut rock. I mean, are the only yeah. places. That's it. Forget it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. David Jackson but, was playing. Uh, he was playing like like fuzzed out saxophone and flute. It was just just really yeah. dissonant and just angry. Hawkwind too. Hawkwind too. With oh yeah, uh, yeah. Turner. yeah. That that's kind of cool when when they do that stuff too, right? Yeah. Um. But uh. Yeah. You know, once you get into the the, the little tiny oboes and and the, that stuff's okay, but but not not the tuba and the brat and and French horn and flugelhorn. I guess it's the same thing more or less. <laughs> but uh, no, I I definitely don't like that stuff. And I remember the Chicago hits from the. 70s and hated it as well but i i mean i'll, I'll give it another try but i i just definitely the way they use horns uh rub me the wrong way so. i'll send you some really good rock and stuff from those first couple albums i think you'll yeah. i think you'll appreciate it yeah, yeah cool. it's not over the horns aren't overbearing it but you listen to the guitar riffs and solos and you're like holy crap it's like yeah, this is yeah. chicago yeah all right my next choice is uh nirvana um you know, Nirvana, this this album here, their first album, uh, I've often rated this my favorite grunge album of all time. It's up there with Green River Rehab Doll and the and the first long EP from Mud Honey, Super Fuzz, Big Muff. Those are the those are the Trinity for me. I love Alice in Chains Dirt as well. Obviously, this was the big album. Um, you know, can I understand why someone wouldn't like this band? I mean, um, you know, is it all grunge for you, more or less? Are you do you have a, a low grunge tolerance? I, I love Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. I yeah. don't really care for much of the rest. Pearl Jam. I remember we talked about that yeah. too. Yeah, but Nirvana, I can understand. Uh, you know, a few things. The the suicide really rubs people the wrong way. I mean, I mean, just that casts a whole pall over everything Nirvana. It it really it really essentially you know to be kind of crude about it turns the turns listening Nirvana into a bummer kind of thing right um because you're always that's always on your mind right um but the other thing of course is that this was such a huge album it was super super hyped um was it overhyped i don't know because it's an amazing album but it's also um quite a bit cleaner than this one this is a really aggressive dark heavy album it's it's not commercial at all um but you know i i don't think the production of this is is particularly um 
particularly uh, too inaccessible. And then they did the third album and then it's actually kind of dirty and, but it's also dirty and dark again. And, and that's a hard album to get into as well. Um, so, so that one's kind of off putting or standoffish. So I, I can understand, I mean, his voice, I don't know. What do you think of his vocals? Do you like his vocals or no? Uh, not at all. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I think he's a great, I think he has, both a great voice and he does cool things with it. So I, I, I guess I would, I've never really thought about it, but I, I would put him in a, I'm, I really like his vocal style. And, and I think he's uh, he has an interesting way of being able to shout with power, but still be melodic at the same time. Some people are just shouty and it, and it doesn't have much dimension to it. I think Roger Daltrey, when he's shouty is, is not all that interesting. Right. Um, but I, I think, um, I think when, when Kurt does that, it's pretty cool. I think the lyrics are are really cool, although they are dark, but I think he does a very good job with it. You can tell these guys are massive music fans, and yet they make fairly simple music, which I guess is probably another reason you're not that big, big a fan of it. Um, they're also one of the bands that started that annoying thing, uh, at, at least a fair bit on this one, where things are rocking out, but then when the verse comes in, it gets kind of quiet, and then that was picked up by by emo music or whatever. I mean, yeah, be considered a little bit of the start of the whole emo thing um but yeah massive band um it's the band that kind of blew grunge wide open and then it just got annoying that everybody everything was grunge 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 all the time but you know i i really can't see how we can really fault a song like smells like teen spirit i think it's just a great well put together song pretty awesome pretty rocking um and and one thing i always felt with grunge and and i still feel it to this day is that you know there is the there is the narrative that it swept away all the hair metal stuff and but but i, I also come into it as a as a metalhead and say it was heavier than most hair metal in a lot of ways and yeah, that's what i kind of liked yeah. about it yeah. And and even there, even even the band on this, I think, is still a pretty heavy rocking band compared even to a lot of hair metal. But this thing's just uh, just an all in out classic, like I say, possibly the best uh, of all. So there you go. Nirvana. Yeah, I mean, I bought into it in the beginning when that mm -hmm. when they came out, I was like, ah, oh, cool, you know, something different, whatever. I don't know. I just yeah, his vocals bothered me. There's kind of like a whininess to the way he sings that I guess never really sat well with me. And after a while. I, you know, I was willing to say, all right, I don't really much like these guys anymore, but I, I kind of accept where they're at and who they are and all that kind of stuff. But I got I got really turned off by this constant. You know, he was constantly talking about how, oh, you know, I don't know, fame and fortune. Ah, yeah, not for me. It's just, like, you know, it's just constant. It's like, well, then, then why are you doing this? You know, and it's and then, you know, when he committed suicide, it was just kind of like. You know, he was he was talking about this kind of stuff for a long time before he 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 did that. And, uh, you know, he just he his DNA was not meant to be this big rock star guy. Just wasn't. And then then why are we there? I don't know. I guess that uh, it, it was just a weird time in music, a weird time in the world, I guess, where all of a sudden everybody thought it was OK to be depressed and it was OK to, uh, you know, talk about your innermost problems that you're dealing with and it just i don't know there's just, the whole scene was kind of a downer for me you know i mean coming out of the 80s wasn't really like that i guess so i don't know i just i got turned off by the whole scene but i always like i said i always really loved alice in chains and sound garden and alice in chains early alice in chains not that much different from a depressing standpoint you listen to some of those early albums there, there's a fair share of that too but um there was more musical dynamics in alice in chains and sound garden and i think just for me nirvana was just very simple kind of caveman -y type stuff and, yep. and not that i don't listen to stuff like that on occasion right i do have bands that that are like that one we might even be talking about in a couple of minutes but um uh yeah i don't know it just it just didn't work for me and i got tired of it really quick like i said i bought into it right off the bat when they first started to get huge and i but i quickly lost interest i will say though smells like teen spirit is a really well-crafted song and I, I i could still listen to that and say yeah that, I, I get that that's what hooked me onto the band initially but then i didn't find much else after uh, other than that that i really liked and i think that was my another big issue for me i really liked that song a lot i didn't really care for the rest of it 
Yeah, and you know, there's only three albums. You can complain that the first one's too dirty. You can complain the second one's too poppy. You can complain that the third one is too dark and too Steve Albini-ish, right? Yeah. And you know, outside of that, there was Incesticide, which uh, which is you know, when Nirvana did the the B side stuff and the and the you know the demo or not to be released stuff, it kind of really was that way because it was already starting from a simple standpoint. So Incesticide is not that interesting, really either and live the live stuff is not that interesting either um yeah. so yeah you, you really only got the three albums to hang your hat on too so yeah it's not a lot it's not a lot yeah. all right next up let's talk about an instrumental band martin's favorite uh, style of music right <laughs> <laughs> no vocals no vocals for the most part uh the dixie dregs so you know a very well respected group within musician circles but if you were to stop like 10 people on the street tomorrow and ask them uh you know who the dixie dregs are i bet you nine or ten out of ten would be like i have no clue who the dixie dregs are who is that like a uh, dixie was that a new country band or something like that not really so this is a band put together by steve morse and company a bunch of southern guys who were real big music nerds. They all went to music school. They're just a bunch of, you know, and he's even said this himself. Hope I'm not offending anybody, but they, they just called themselves a bunch of rednecks from the South who were really uh, into music and really wanted to play complicated, fun stuff. Uh, Steve Morse was a dedicated Mahavishnu Orchestra fan growing up. So they all had their like jazz training and they were all fans of jazz music and, and things like that. And they released, you know, a bunch of very respected albums that, you know, didn't really do a hell of a lot of business. Uh, this is what if might be what many consider their best album. And the problem with this band is they were kind of like all over the map, stylistically speaking, and they, they had no vocals. So you're not going to get played on the radio because you don't have any vocals. And your music is like this mix of like jazz and fusion and rock and little bits of blues and bluegrass and country and classical and chamber and baroque and it's just like what is all this stuff uh you know the musicianship is absolutely spectacular but other than like a few songs here and there you know not a lot of, there's a couple songs that have good hooks for instrumental songs but for the most part it's just challenging listening and if you are someone who likes you know pop hooks or big nice riffs and memorable anthemic songs this is not going to be for you at all and i think that uh even and they also came around a little bit too late because if, i think if the dregs came out in like the early mid 70s and started releasing albums they would have caught on to the heyday of fusion this is when you know miles davis and return to forever mahavishnu weather report all those kind of bands were selling lots of records uh, but by the time the dregs came around in the late 70s that was all done already so here they are fighting to stay alive and they did a lot of touring they did a lot of uh tour dates with bands who were of the totally complete opposite right not necessarily bands like them so i think they really struggled to find their audience you know steve morris was very acclaimed as one of the best guitar players on the face of the planet he won lots of uh, guitar player awards year after year but the band never made a lot of money and it wasn't until uh this album which is the one i would recommend to you martin uh which is industry standard and this was the last album they did in the 80s they even changed the name to the dregs. They probably figured that this Dixie thing is probably steering people in, in a different direction. Then they hear the music, they're like, oh, what the hell is this? So Industry Standard actually had uh, two vocal tracks on them, which are pretty good, pretty accessible. Uh, Alex Ligertwood from Santana sang on one and Patrick Simmons from the Doobie Brothers sang on the other. And they're good songs. It's not really what I want to hear personally from the dregs, but you almost wonder if they would have decided to take that route and go, you know, all vocal. Might be talking about a different story here at this point. I'm kind of glad they didn't. But uh, yeah, I get it. This is this is at times very weird music. I, I have played Dixie Dregs music to people who don't like instrumental music, don't like prog, jazz, fusion, bluegrass country. And they're like, what the hell is this? They're like, yeah, that's a pretty ripping guitar and a little, a little too much violin and uh, you got some piano there, but it all doesn't make sense. To me, it makes a lot of sense, but I totally get where people hear this and they're like, I just don't understand this at all. But musically speaking from a, you know, like a virtuoso perspective, a band full of geniuses, but probably not understood by the masses i totally understand that yeah my my problem is i i just barely even consider instrumental music without vocals and lyrics to be 
like literally a ceiling of 30%. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even anywhere. I'm not, I'm not even getting close to being interested in it. So jazz and classical, obviously there's huge, you know, full industries of this kind of music. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I remember, I probably mentioned this before, but I remember arguing with Richie Blackmore about this, this, you know, whole thing. And he goes, imagine that instrumental music, right. Music <laughs> without singing, you know, it's, it's still, it's music. They call it music at all. So he kind of, he kind of had, had this, this oblique way of making a point about it. Right. Uh, that it's like surreal to consider music without without you know vocals on it it's it's almost like music without vocals is almost like more music than yeah. than, uh, than music with vocals music with vocals is almost sounds like an impurity in a way right it's like well yeah i mean historically yeah. yeah it's absolutely. like music with a car beside it or something right yes. it's like <laughs> Right. Uh, so so no, I, I don't even I don't even get close on that. I remember all the hype, you know, around Karma to Burn. And there we had this uh, kind of hyped. What were they called? War something up in Canada. There was a hyped band that War Machine, I think they were called, you know, no, no vocals, heavy metal. It's like, no, nope, can't get into it. So I don't know. All yeah. right. Uh, my next one, um, I know I'm yapping too much. This is kind of going long. So I'll, I'll go a little shorter on this one because this one I don't have a huge a huge, uh, you know, I'm going to proselytize like crazy about, but U2. Pete's not a big U2 guy. There's some later, later era U2. There's some hits U2. Um, there's some sort of single. Um, and, you know, when U2 got noisy and thought they could be every kind of band to everybody and do everything great because that's who they are. They're kind of like smarmy. We're the greatest people in the world. We can do anything. Uh, that's when I didn't like U2. You know, I certainly don't like this era of U2. But, you know, but I, I bought in. I bought into the messianic U2, right? The Brian Eno U2, and Joshua Tree and, uh, you know, Boy. All, all that early stuff, which was really cool, interesting post-punk. That fit in the whole Teardrop Explodes, Echo and the Bunny and the cure uh, type thing those early albums october and all that um so i thought i thought it was super super interesting for quite a while and then i started to you know rattle and hum was okay but people considered that an overrated thing and oh now we're now we're americana and we're we're like we've we've tapped into the soul of america even though we're from ireland and all this stuff yeah. so i can see there's a lot of reasons to not like them Anything kind of messianic can can drive people the, the wrong way. It's like, oh, this guy's the savior of the world and rock and roll and all that. That could drive people the wrong way, uh, or rub people the wrong way. But uh, but also, I can understand how uh, this idea of thinking you can try everything, Zeropa and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I I can't stand that stuff. It's just so noisy. I can totally understand that. The massive stage shows when you're supposed to be, you know, a band with values and all this kind of stuff. And then you're, then you've got the biggest stage shows in the entire world, right. Uh, all time over and over and over again. Right. Um, and, and, you know, even his own band doesn't like Bono preaching from the stage and all this, so they can be very political. And so, you know, soon as soon as you're going to be political that's literally half the people are going going to really hate it and half the people are going to really like it right at least at least as far as uh you know any any of the polar uh, the most polarized countries go right um so there you go i i can understand i can understand you you two on a, on a number of uh cases and and then even when they were the it band and everybody loved them you could you could uh, you could definitely fall on one side or the other based on this whole uh messianic thing right yeah there you go. yeah i you know to me youtube's politicalness or not doesn't really bother me i, I tend to ignore that type of stuff I, it's like you know if, if bands and and rock stars and what have you want to go get on these rants about things that that's all fine and dandy i try to separate that from the music because it's like yeah they can just like me they can believe what they want to believe they can have opinions on whatever they want it comes down to the music for me uh, i actually didn't mind you two at all very early in their career i thought the early part of their career was kind of cool and naive and fun and they had like an edge to them an edge to them uh but um and i and i like i like a good chunk of their hits. This is one of those bands where like, I really, I liked always kind of dug some of the hits, not all of them, not all of them. And I was always like, Oh, there's probably a lot more to them than the hits. And this is one of those bands. And we did a show last year about bands. You only really need the greatest hits compilation. They're that for me without a doubt, because I, I tried to dive into some of their albums and see what other gems are in there. And I didn't much care for a lot of the other stuff. I was kind of like, eh, to me, you two, is has been a phenomenon in popular music for a long long time 
I always felt they're a little overrated. Me personally, I know a lot of people aren't going to agree with that because they are one of the biggest bands on the planet and they have been for what, 35 plus years. But uh, they have some really good songs. I also don't like the noisy period stuff. I find that stuff just kind of harsh on the ears. I like when they were doing, I think the early stuff is so much better and so much more listenable. And uh, yeah, you know, Bono is, he's kind of a polarizing figure and, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, Edge he's got his own guitar style it's not really my cup of tea but i i get it so i don't know i i think i'm more with this band i'm more kind of indifferent to them than anything else don't love them don't hate them like some of the hits don't really like the deep cuts don't need to own any of their albums don't really even like i had like i said i had that like beefy compilation cd that's got like every song you'd probably want from them that was ever played on the radio or that they play live and I, I probably haven't listened to it in 10 years. It's like, cause I just, I, it's like, I felt like I had to have it because you have to have some U2 in your collection. Right. But I just, I, most of those songs, I'm like, they're okay. I never need to hear them though. I don't know. If they're, to me, they're a band that's been very, very overplayed. Uh, to me, there's, a, there's always been a lot of hype around them and I just never really bought into it, but I don't dislike them at all. Um, but they're just not, uh, I don't think about them. I'm very indifferent to them. It's, yeah. it's just kind of weird, but apparently they're super nice guys and really approachable and they're really huge music fans and kind of kind of grounded dudes so that yeah. that's that's kind of nice about them but i i and, and i i like that edge has his own guitar style that he kind of came up with oh, absolutely really cool yeah. but you know when you mentioned that i i often i i thought as well that they have this sort of um tribal raw quality to that early mm. stuff in a way like like even even the huge albums are not are not overproduced they're just atmospheric and and murky yeah. and uh and there's often kind of tribal drumming and a kind of a straightforward so there's a there's a simplicity factor again as well with b2 i think yeah i remember when joshua tree came out and people were hailing it as like a you know rock masterpiece one of the greatest rock records of all time and i was kind of like all right yeah it's a couple of good songs right it's, uh, i just i don't know i didn't get it quite i was like it's okay I think that's that's like it's like weird. I have a really weird relationship with you two. I'm like I, I just like I'm I'm not not really strong one way or the other. I'm just kind of like very down the middle. I'm accepting of it, but I don't necessarily really enjoy it. Right? Yeah. It's weird. I, I, I've never been able to put my finger on you two for some reason because I get asked about you two all the time from people on the channel constantly. It's like people you never talk about you two. You have, don't you have an opinion on you two? It's like I really don't. <laughs> I just don't. I don't know. I've tried. So, <laughs> cool. All right. So here's uh here's an interesting. So we're gonna go way back with this band. So uh, Cream. So you know Martin's not a fan of Cream, and uh, not a, not a long career, not a lot of albums, right? Very known for their live performances, while their studio stuff is a little little reserved. I think. I, I you know this is and, and this is a weird one here because I I think that like. I can totally get why you don't like the studio stuff. And then I know why you don't like the live stuff, right? That's, that's very obvious, right? But to me, I really, I like Cream a lot, but I tend to think I'd rather hear them live because I think that's really where their personality comes out. I find their studio albums kind of confusing because there's this perception in rock history that Cream were one of the first heavy bands, right? Do you find any of their stuff all that heavy? <laughs> not particularly not right i mean you know sunshine of your love's got that kind of heavy riff and there's a couple of the songs here and there but i don't find them heavy that to me they're like the first like kind of jam band and i like them for that i find that their albums are fairly inconsistent they're loaded with classics but you know there's weird kind of like semi poppy psychedelic talking through the lyrics and then you got some songs that are kind of bluesy and rocking with some great guitar work by Clapton you got Clapton and Jack Bruce singing some people don't like Jack Bruce's vocals some people do um I don't know I I like I said I really like Cream a lot but I find that when I want to listen to Cream I go and I reach for something like this, but I know something like this, you know, either the two live albums and you got, you know, the live side to this one, uh, 
the endless guitar, bass, and drum solos drive people mad. And then you got, you know, you got Ginger Baker, who to me is, I always kind of put him in the same category as like a Keith Moon. Very unpredictable, a lot of great skills. I love him as a drummer, but for some people, his he's all over the place. And it's just like, I always found that like with Cream Live, they're like three guys that are not always on the same page and any one of them can go off into like charts unknown on, and there were, the others are probably wondering where the hell is he going with that and let's bring him back in so yeah i mean and they have some good radio hits and some nice bluesy stuff but i i, I don't know they're a legendary band are they as legendary as like a who or the stones or sabbath or zeppelin or any of those kind of bands i don't know or hendrix or Hendrix, right? I think there are elements of this band that yes, they absolutely belong to be spoken about in with in that company. Uh, but sometimes I go back and I listen to the albums and I'm kind of like, hmm, I get it where people would say, yeah, Cream, not, not as important as some of these other bands. I think, you know, they were one of the, the first true, true super group. And I think all three of them were such virtuosos and they did do some legendary stuff together, but it's such a small catalog. They were together such a short period of time before they imploded that it, it's kind of hard to assess this band for me. I do like them and respect them quite a bit, but uh, you know, where I would steer Martin, he's not going to want to go. So the, the, till the live cream stuff, you know, with half hour songs and eight minute drum solos and endless bass and guitar solos. Yeah, I, I know that's totally not for you. But to me, that's where this band really shines is live. But you have to be into that sort of kind of jammy, just go for it, bluesy, jazzy, hard rock type of thing that they were doing. And it's, it's totally not for everybody. It's totally not for everybody. But like I said, the people who like just the radio type hits and the short two and a half, three minute long songs, they probably won't like this and uh, that is what it is right so yeah i mean to me no one really particularly likes the first album no one particular particularly likes the last album so you're left with just the stuff in the middle yeah there's kind of the big hits which are the, the seminal sort of hard rocky riffy songs um don't like ginger as a drummer never never got that um never understood i i find most of what he does pretty pretty tasteless uh don't like eric as a guitarist i certainly don't like the eric clapton solo uh career uh that's that's a whole nother thing jack bruce as a bassist i can't even picture love jack bruce's voice that's my favorite part of cream i i just love i could listen to him sing over anything oh, i love all this solo stuff. i would agree with you i love the this robin voice. trower yeah. stuff yeah. um but yeah lo love um love him as a singer jerky guys again you know ginger notoriously one you know one of the top jerky guys in the world apparently and jack bruce certainly was that way air clapped and i'm not positive on that but you know there's been certain things lately he's been in the news for um but uh but that that bothers me as well um the idea of the being overrated thing um you know they're rated super highly so of course they're overrated for that reason so yeah just never never been you know i i compare them to the parallel career doing the same thing sort of thing. Hendrix and Hendrix, I think, blows them away. Uh, everybody in the band, you, you know, just tastefulness of, of the playing of everybody in the band and the interesting things they're doing, I think, is better. Cream to me, it was always a little caveman -y, um, and dated um, and all that jammy stuff. So add all that up. And th those are my reasons for not being a big cream guy. So. Yeah, I, I don't think the cream stuff has aged as well as the Hendrix stuff. Uh, and, you know, they're, the, the parallels are pretty similar because both around, like, for just a few short years, a handful of albums, although, you know, we've gotten a ton of stuff from Hendrix after he died. But, uh, yeah, I, I think for me, if, if I were to look at all the cream studio stuff, take out the best of because all those albums are pretty short anyway. You take out the best from all those albums, you have a pretty damn great album. It's a lot of filler on, that, on those albums, a lot, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and it hasn't aged well. Like some of that stuff, just like you listen to it, you're like, yeah, oh yeah, that sounds 1967, sure. Yeah. All right, my last one to uh, to bring some comedic value uh, to this show. Uh, poison. Huh. Good old Poison. Yeah. Pete's favorite. There you go. Um, so yeah, my my open minded understanding of why someone wouldn't like Poison. There's a lot of reasons. Uh, being the you know the typical glam band is one. Um, the idea of being kind of uh, prima donna, maybe jerky guys, uh, but that whole thing, like all those reasons why hair metal had to die, 
Many of them uh, you could accuse poison of. Um, the whole neon green thing, typo negative did it better. Um, and, uh, and the simplicity of the music. Uh, this is hair metal that's not particularly sophisticated. I mean, I, there's a lot of hair metal that I totally love, like Badlands and Love Hate. I thought Skid Row was good in, in the beginning and Guns N' Roses. There's a, there's a lot of bands that are a lot more sophisticated than Poison. Poison was essentially almost like the hair metal version of Kiss. They were considered the Kiss of hair metal somewhat. C.C. DeVille with the piercing guitar solos, like so loud and annoying. He's almost like like the um what's what's the garbage can drummer in sesame street he's he's that guy oh, yeah. of guitar solos in a way um yeah they, he's the keith mood of guitar animal, solos. Animal, animal animal yeah he's the animal of guitar solos um you know and then i think another annoying thing about poison is this is this trying to claim an americanness right with the with the cowboy hats and all that brett michaels fancying himself as a as a john mellon camp you know i mean i suppose he's as good as a john bon jovi because i certainly do not like Bon Jovi as a band, never have. Um, so I, I, I don't consider John Bon Jovi on any pedestal above Brett Michaels, but John, John Mellencamp to me is a God. And so is Bruce Springsteen in that, in that oeuvre. Right. Um, but yeah, so there is that too. There's the, there's the truck stop Americana, the Walmart Southern rock uh, idea of poison that rubs people the wrong way as well the big show might rub people the wrong way oh you're oh you're doing the big show to uh to you know uh overcompensate for the music or whatever uh the maudlin ballads um there's a lot of reasons uh but i i per i personally never was into the big poison albums i got into them during these eras and and i i fully admit it's because i started interviewing the guys and really liked what they had to say about what they were doing i met them in person many times and i would go to those repackaged shows like i say never a poison fan in the beginning to me i loved grunge and poison like i say was one of the reasons hair metal had to die it was just never a band i got into and in you know look what the cat dragged in open up and say ah uh, native tongue or whatever it's called yeah i think it's the third one um but uh but I got into them later. Uh, but yeah, just I, I think there's a lot of reasons to think that they're kind of one of the uh, one of the reasons hair metal had to die. So I can understand it. There you go. Poison. Uh, where do I begin with this one? Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you how many people I come into contact with uh, who, you know, outside of like the music industry. And they're like, really, you don't like poison? It's like, but there's so much fun, Pete. How can you not like Poison? And I'm like, it's like, listen, I have fun with like a Gentle Giant record and you're going to expect me to have fun with a Poison record. I, I just, I don't find the music fun. Uh, it's really simplistic. I just, I don't enjoy their, their songs at all. And I don't like their image. Uh, I don't like looking at them. Uh, you know, Chris Al always makes this joke that like some of the guys in Poison are better looking than some of the chicks that were in, in bands and out in the scene back in the day. But I, yeah, I, don't, I don't really care about that. I just, I, it, to me, it comes down to the music and the albums and I don't find it appealing at all. Um, I can appreciate the commerciality of it. I mean, they write some good hooks, right? It's just not, it's not for me. I don't know. This, this is just a band I have been, a solid no on from the beginning. And uh, I will be quite honest, I really haven't tried to dive any further into them. I was like, I was not into them when they first came out. I, I, I've heard the first handful of albums. I saw them live. It's one of the worst bands I ever saw live. And I just, from that point on, I'm like, yeah, that's it. Poison and me is does not compute. So yeah. It's Incredibly maudlin choruses and stuff. Like it, it is very uh, the Americana part of them kind of drives me the wrong way. Like I don't like that side of it. I like there is some kind of com more complex and interesting things they do later on, and the drumming gets more interesting. But yeah, it's uh, there's there's a strong Bon Jovi thing to them that I I definitely don't like. But uh, yeah. but I kind of did find them fun going out to those package things. You know when they, yeah. they would play the shed here in Toronto, Molson Amphitheater and stuff, and on a big bill, and you'd see a lot of people out because that was all during that whole era where metal is dying, everything's dying. You know, and, and none of this stuff is doing that well. And hair metal is you know certainly had never had any sort of a comeback so it was neat to see you know a lot of people coming out for rock and roll right yeah i find too a lot of these people that i that i mentioned before that i talked to who were like oh I love poison they're so much fun you know what they find fun the like the six songs that they know from mtv and the radio they don't know anything else by them yeah yeah <laughs>
yeah sure. that's all they want to hear it's like those those, those yeah. it's like all right that's fine that's your yeah. all right so i saved for last i was actually gonna do these guys second but I, I decided to save them for last because i think out of all the bands that we are talking about today i'm actually really surprised that martin doesn't get into these guys and I, that's why i saved them for last grand funk railroad I know Martin loves a lot of like kind of garagey type stuff and like, and there's a, especially the early part of the catalog, there's this kind of like homegrown for the people Neanderthalness of Grand Funk Railroad that I'm, I'm really surprised you don't like, but, but I get it. Uh, and, and if it was anybody else I was talking to, I, I would say, I understand the not appealness of this band right so they were never never proclaimed to be the greatest musicians on the planet right uh you listen to various live recordings there they can be somewhat sloppy i think that was just part of their appeal uh their music is not very sophisticated especially early on um mark farner while i think is one of the great underrated front men in rock and roll history he never claimed to be the best guitar player in the world. A lot of the guitar riffs and things are, you know, kind of simplistic. Good vocalist, though. Uh, you've got these weirdly produced albums, which, you know, and you brought this up on many occasions where, you know, Grand Funk Railroad is many times touted, from myself included, as one of the great he early heavy bands. And, and, you know, but you listen to some of these albums, they're really not all that heavy. Like, I think the songs are heavy in nature, but the execution, the production is really not. Like Mark Farner's guitar work on most of these studio albums, kind of clean sounding. Like, it's almost like, well, if you add some fuzz and some distortion, then all of a sudden maybe, you know, things might sound a little different. That being said, a lot of really, really great songs on some of these albums. I just pulled out a bunch of my favorites here. Like Martin, E Pluribus Funk, my favorite album from them. Amazing. Uh, the really long albums too surprisingly for this time i mean especially like their debut is like god this this almost could have been a double album it's probably not far from it uh but again production is kind of it's weird you got these songs that want to be heavy because they're a fairly like a uh, raucous type of band the arrangements are usually fast paced but the guitar sound needed a little more oomph but i think i know a lot of people don't mind that too much but it because it kind of separated them a little bit from some of the other bands on the scene but they had their definitely had their heavy moments. They did some more atmospheric type stuff. They had some radio hits, uh, but some of their songs are. It's kind of weird because you got this really up tempo, fiery and furious music, and then they mix like R and B and funk elements, which is a little weird. I mean, there really wasn't anybody else doing this at the time. But then I think you know they got more sophisticated. They started working with Todd Rundgren on the We're an American Band, which has great songs on it. It's missing the rawness of these early albums. But you know, all of a sudden they added Craig Frost on keyboards, becoming more accessible, shining on, kind of rinse repeat there. I would say I would recommend for Martin here uh, the the not the last album they did, but the last album they did in the seventies um, is uh, Good Singing, Good Playing where they're hooked up with Frank Zappa. This is actually a really fun album. And I think it takes the sophistication of those Todd Rundgren produced albums, some really good songs and melodies and things like that. Uh, but it returns them back to the kind of more raucous nature of their early stuff, but it's better produced. There's good guitar work on here. The guitar sounds great. Really good songs. It's just a really fun, like hard rock record, I think. So, but I get it. I mean, they're, hey, let, let's, let's be frank here. Most of the critics back in the day hated these guys. This was a band for the people, the song lyrics, especially early on. It's like they were trying to appeal to the teens and the college students uh, with their distaste for war and what's going on in politics and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you today people would probably call them a pretty, um, you know, they're, they're being really relative to what's going on in the world. But, you know, back then you were looked at by critics if you were singing too much about, you know, you're being against the Vietnam War and against Watergate and blah, 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 all that stuff that's going on. It's like, uh, you know, that's not really the cool thing to do, but the people love these guys. That's why they've always been called the people's band. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I thought they were a kind of a cool phenomenon. I really enjoy their music quite a bit. But another polarizing band, because to some people who have a little bit more sophisticated taste, this is like caveman music, right? Got these three guys making a lot of noise. They don't especially play any of their instruments all that well. Uh, their songs are kind of Neanderthal, maybe not all that interesting. Yeah, they got a couple of hits, but there's not much else. I think there's a lot 
there's a lot in their catalog that's just really, really good. They, they, one of my favorite deep cut bands of all time is Grand Funk Forever, but I get it. I think the critics also didn't like them because it, Terry Knight, right? That was the yeah. manager, right? That's his yeah. name. Like he he promoted the hell out of them. Oh, yeah. So yeah. many ads and billboards and, and they did well. And then they put yeah. out albums super fast and they all went gold and all this stuff. And they were, but they always called themselves like the biggest band in the world, right? Kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, they were so, so heavy on the promotion. I think that rubs critics the wrong way too. But uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I don't like the funk and R&B elements and, and, you're right. I guess the guitars are kind of clean. The vocals are certainly clean. So you don't, you don't get that thing in the vocal end of things, causing it to sound more extreme either. Right. So everything, you know, I always used to joke because so many people love grand funk and, and it just seems like a band I should like, but I used to joke that, uh, you know, God gave me a whole different set of grand funk albums than everybody else. Cause, <laughs> cause it, it literally fit, feels like a band where am I, or am I even listening to the same band as all these people? Um, so yeah, I, I, I've owned them all and just, just never get into them in a big way. I know the red albums considered a great early heavy metal album and all this stuff. It's like, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not hearing the heaviness really out of this band. Right. And not they, even that early, just, not even that early live album, huh? Yeah. Well, li live is a, live is a trick though. Right. Live doesn't count in a, in a way. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I know the red albums, it's fairly heavy, right. Um, for its day i think it's 69 or something like yeah, that i yeah. mean they, they started pretty early yeah. um but yeah just uh just that whole the, the the they're kind of the mix of the two detroit things and and one of them is simple hard rock which is not all that incredibly interesting and the other one is the motown and the r&b kind of thing yeah. so they're mixing these two things together and then coming into the 70s with it and still sounding kind of dated um and just yeah never never been a never been a big fan but yeah. what, what can you do like we always say, you can't like everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the point of this whole episode. And we, we get it. So uh, there you have it, everybody. Some bands that each of us like that the other doesn't. And we understand why. So no hard feelings, right, Marvel Shake on it? Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we got that one out of the way, we'll uh, move to other uh, topics starting next week. So uh, thanks for watching. This was actually fun to do. And uh Martin, what's uh, what's what do you got in stock? Are you, are you talking about the deal book before? It's uh, you got plenty left. Yeah, this is the this is the big thing. So this came in a couple of days ago, three days ago. Dream Evil deal in the '80s, and it's uh, it's moving quite well. I'm packing up a ton of books. I got a few pages of uh, orders to get uh, before the end of the day into the mail. So that's uh, came out martinpopoff.com, and of course, uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the priest review, the visual. Um, so yeah, that, that's still going and, uh, and the UFO, and I still have all the other ones, the heap, the Van Halen, the blueish occult. So, uh, martinpopoff.com for that stuff. I got the podcast history and five songs with Martin Popoff. The last was, was on fade outs. What happens as songs are fading out and, uh, we've got the contrarians. So that's the whole package. A lot of good stuff. Very cool. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. Visit us on Facebook and Twitter. But of course, we're here all together all the damn time on YouTube. We've got coming up here on the channel. We have tomorrow. We've got the UK connection with uh, Simon Brain, Stephen Reed. we got a fun little rant for you of, um, I guess, things that upset us that happen at concerts so uh check out that that was a lot of fun that, that was that was uh, intended to be something pretty simple and it, and it wound up becoming this full-blown hour plus rant on the uh, shit that happens at concerts which is uh it was pretty fun uh then we've got the uh, album homework assignment coming up on sunday sydney taylor and nick franco from hudson valley squares going head to head so that's happening on sunday we've also got all right so there is no hudson valley squares on monday i will be actually at a comedy event um and we were unable to align everybody's schedules to record an episode. However, I have a very cool substitute for the Hudson Valley Square as an interview with a very, very famous person uh, that'll be airing on Monday. I'm not going to give it away. So you'll just have to tune in Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to check out the episode. Uh, and uh, other than that, for Martin Popo, find P. Parter. We'll see you next Friday, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.